thank you for joining us again today. Hey, it is Mother's Day. Make sure you celebrate or remember your mother today. So again, thank you for tuning in and just let us know you're watching by making a comment, liking something. Don't forget to follow and subscribe on our social media platforms, okay? So the fun fact for today, and this is a Mother's Day version. Um, did you know the most kids, Mrs. Vasilyev of Russia gave birth to 69 children between 1725 and 1765. That's a 40 year span with 1.7 kids per year. Pretty amazing, 69 kids. The oldest mom in 1994 in Italy, Rosanna Della Corda gave birth to a baby boy. She was 63 years old and the heaviest newborn in Signora, um, Signora uh, Carmelina Fidel gave birth to a 22 pound, eight ounce baby boy in Italy in 1955. Kind of just makes you wonder, did she sit on his lap when she was rocking him to sleep? So, hey, get ready. We're gonna play a game, uh, um, Two Truths and a Lie. So get ready to text into this number, 951-382-5111 and you are going to give us what you believe to be the lie. I am going to introduce someone special. This is my mom, Diane. Hello, mom. All right, so I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like I have known you my whole life. So we are going to get on with two truths and a lie. Here they are. Number one, because my mom is so virtuous. Here we go. My mom has never been pulled over by a police officer. Two. She has never caused a car accident. Number three, she has never received a ticket. So you need to text in what you think the lie is, and uh, we'll get to that in just a minute. But mom, just want to ask you on Mother's Day, what do you remember most about your first experience being a mother? Well, I loved children all my life, and when I got married, I, I just wanted a baby so soon after marriage, my husband didn't agree, but you know how us women get our way. So after 10 and a half months of marriage, at the age of 18, I gave birth to my first little baby girl. And when she came out, I had had a long labor and she was what they called a cone head, but I didn't care. I looked at her and said, Oh, isn't she beautiful, honey? And my husband just looked at her and said, do you really think so? Well, that kind of deflated me, but I thought, well, pretty soon we'll try again. And we did. And a year and a half later, I gave birth to this blessing. And when he came out, he was totally bald headed, but you know, we had our boy, so who cared? He didn't say anything about his looks then. It was just his boy. So everyone said what a nice shaped head he had. So then shortly after that, I thought we should try for a third because the third time's the charm, and she was. She had a beautiful shaped head, full of beautiful brown hair, so I guess the joy of motherhood was just uh, just experiencing all those emotions. And it, it was just pure joy that God blessed me with these three children. And I never regretted a minute, even when the class clown here would get in trouble and bring notes home from school, um, that he needed to realize he was there to learn, not to entertain. But uh, it was okay. He was a good entertainer. <laughs> and, and just for those out there, Renee, Renee, my older sister, it, I had a perfectly shaped head. You looked like an alien. I think this really just speaks to our childhood. So, um, hey, real quick, um, what is the lie? The lie is that I never received a ticket. I never received a moving violation but I did get a parking ticket, so I had to fess up to that. 
and led them on a police chase. She escaped, <laughs> she escaped prison and everything. So, all right, we're gonna play a game of this and that. And I'm just gonna ask you this or that, and you pick which one you can't waver, you have to pick one. So, this or that, do you prefer Amazing Grace or How Great Thou Art? Amazing Grace, because by grace we were saved. Church mu worship music, do you sing loud and proud or are you as quiet as a church mouse? When I was younger, I sang loud and proud because my voice didn't crackle, but now I whisper. And uh, I have made fun of you about technology on these things at times, but do you prefer email or to write a letter? Well, due to the arthritis I have, I have to go with email now. Right. And someone is driving next to you with their blinker on. Do you speed up or do you slow down? Oh, I definitely slow down. And last but not least, who is your favorite child, me or Renee? Oh gosh, she was my favorite conehead baby and you were my favorite bald baby. That's, yeah. Cut out the conehead part, just the favorite baby <laughs> me, me, me. All right, hey, just so if you're new here, I just wanna let you know what to expect. We are beginning a series called The Four Movement Family. And it's gonna be looking at the family through the lens of the four movements of God's story. So be here all four weeks. It's gonna be an incredible series. And also, if you're new, text um, new to this number right here. Let us know so we can engage with you and let you know you were here. Have a happy Mother's Day. Celebrate your mom. Give her a kiss. Enjoy. I know I will. Enjoy the service. Hey, happy Mother's Day and welcome to Olive Branch. We're so glad you joined us. We just want to sing a blessing over you moms out there. We're so thankful for all of you. Today we pray for mothers everywhere. Bless moms who are expecting a baby, calm their fears and keep their new little life safe. 
plus mothers who have babies and toddlers and are in the busy season of bottles, sippy cups, and endless laundry. Give strength to moms of little ones. They need it, Lord. Bless mothers who have busy school-aged children. Gift them with an extra measure of wisdom to answer questions, model maturity, and mold young hearts. Bless mothers who parent teens. Allow them the grace to let go when they need to and the courage to provide firm boundaries when required. Bless mothers of adult children that they would savor the joy of friendship with their adult child. Bless single mothers with the strength to fulfill many roles. Provide them with supportive people in their lives. Bless moms who are married, that their marriage would stay strong as they raise their children together with their spouse. Bless grandmothers who have the double blessing of being both mother and grandmother. May they spoil their grandkids with abandon, but not too much abandon. <laughs> we pray peace for mothers who have lost a child and for women who are grieving because of infertility. Touch them, Lord. Give us eyes to see women around us who struggle. Help us be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. Thank you for our mothers. They gave us life, and for that gift, we are forever grateful. We pray for mothers everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and their family and their children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. 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 Happy M
Oh my goodness, weren't they just absolutely adorable? I just want to say happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to all of you new moms, you moms that are going to be having babies, moms that have older children, younger children. We just want to celebrate you today. We know that there's a lot that goes into being a mom. We know that your days never end and you don't rest very much. And I was actually even looking on the internet and if you got paid for everything you do, you would actually make over $180,000 a year but because you have the heart that you do, you know you do it because you love your kiddos. And I'm sure every day you get to the end of the day and think, how did I make it through that day? And then you look at those faces like the ones we saw on that screen and you know exactly how you got through your day. And we just thank you for giving of your hearts and all that you have to serve your families. And we want to take the time to just thank our congregation and all that they do to give of their time their talents, their abilities, their resources, and their funds to make this home, this church home, what it is. And we, we thank you for all that you help us to do in this uh, city and to minister to all these families that we get to minister to. We have so many amazing ministries and it's because of your giving. And so right now we would just want to take the time to pray for that giving. And we also want to take the time to pray for you moms and to celebrate you. So will you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you. We thank you for our moms. Lord, we thank you for their love, their unconditional love. We thank you for all that they give of themselves until they can't give anymore, Father God. We thank you for the way that they take care of everybody else's needs before their own, Lord. We just pray you would allow them to feel so loved and so special and so appreciated today, Lord. Father God, we also pray for those that may be hurting today. We know today is a day to celebrate moms, but we also know that there might be some that are hurting. There might be those that desperately want to be a mom and can't. There might be those who have lost children and are mourning today. There might be those that have broken relationships with their moms. And we just, we want to pray over those people and Lord, just let them feel loved, Lord. Let their hurts just be comforted and just uh, surrounded by your peace and your comfort today, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for women that you created and the ability, Lord, to just have children and bring them into this world. And we, we celebrate that and we also mourn and pray for those that are, are hurting today. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, going back a ways, we met at 14. Uh, so what did I love about uh, Gina at that time? 14-year-olds um, definitely like girls. Um, so I, I would say that, um, I don't know that it was love at first sight, but it was like her a lot at first sight. And um, yeah, it was just, uh, one of those things where I just knew that there was something more than just, you know, having a girlfriend there. Our lockers were like five lockers apart, and we met the Friday before our freshman year of high school started. Howdy day. Howdy day. Yeah. And uh, I noticed his corduroy yellow OP shorts. They were short shorts. Very short. And a hang ten shirt with the stripes, and his little knobby knees. But for me, it felt like love at first sight at 14. Yep. We were young. We were young. Yeah, as I thought about the future, I, I could never see things in the future without Bob being a part of it. So, um, just dreamed of doing fun things together, raising a family together. We had dreams and we really wanted to have children early. Uh, we wanted to raise a family and we kind of um, had the conversation of whether or not we wanted to have kids early. and you know, um, you know, be able to be young grandparents and that, or whether we wanted to wait and travel and do some stuff at that point in time and, you know, have kids later. So for me, I think, I think that was a dream of ours to have a have family. So we did choose to have kids early on. Um, really early on, I think the night that we had the conversation about wanting to have kids soon, but we had kids when we were still kids. So yeah. We did have kids young. Which is a story in itself, but uh, we not only grew up together, uh, but we 
actually grew up with our kids in, in some ways, so. I knew that we were gonna grow old together. We talked. We would always hold hands and, and talk, whether we were walking or sitting, I know this sounds cheesy, on a bench, but we did yeah. sit a lot and talk about growing old together. And here so, we are. And here we are. <laughs> Well, happy Mother's Day, and I hope you moms out there that are spending time with your family at home are having a good one. Whether you're gathering around right now to watch this sermon or to be together just for the day, or it's even after Mother's Day and you're watching it later in the evening or the next day, hey, happy Mother's Day. I hope it was great. I hope that you're having a great day. God bless you, moms. You do some awesome stuff. And that's why I want to start with a story that's more for dads. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, what's interesting is the story is really a story that came out of our family um, because I love telling stories to my kids and we have three boys and my wife is a you know a, a boy mom in the sense that she loves these little boys being boys now my daughter loves being a part of this stuff too and laughs at these kinds of things so please forgive the little story for a minute but I want to tell you the story I used to tell my kids when they were little it's kind of just a fun little um, little parable and we would talk about the idea of my son Andrew he's the youngest and we'd talk about the fact or the idea that one day when Andrew is little he woke up and he thought, I really want to fly. And he desired so badly to fly, he went out to his brothers and he said to his brothers, ah, guys, I want to fly. I want to fly. If you just help me, I want to learn how to fly. And his brothers are like, well, all you got to do is climb up on the roof and they're giggling to each other and jump off, Andrew, and you'll fly. Well, Andrew's not so dumb, so he thinks, okay, if I get up there and flap my arms fast enough, I'll fly. So he puts out some cushions and stuff at the bottom of the house, and he jumps off the roof, flapping his arms as fast as he can, and falls straight to the ground, right into the, right into the pillows and everything. And he's not hurt. He's okay. He gets up, but he's really bummed. He wants to fly so bad. So he goes to his sister, says, Adeline, I just want to know how to fly. How, what do I do to fly? The birds can fly. She says, that's right, the birds can fly. We'll make you some wings, and those wings will help you fly. And so they sit down, they make all these wings together, and very pretty wings, and they put them on, and Andrew goes out, and he starts flapping his arms and running and tries the same thing, gets up on the roof, flaps, 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 same result. Falls right to the ground, into the pillows. It's just bummed. Well, next thing you know, he's out standing on the side of the street. He's just bummed, he's crying, and all along comes this, this ice cream truck. Ding, ding, doo, 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 and he pulls up next to him. He's like, hey, and what's wrong, little boy? Do you want some ice cream? Make you happy? He's like, what? He's like, all I want to do is fly. And the, man, and the ice cream man looks down and says, well, I have something that'll help you fly. Here, if you go get some money, you can buy these magic beans. These magic beans, if you turn them into a stew and eat them, you'll be able to fly. And Andrew gets all excited. He runs inside, grabs his money, comes out and pays for it, takes the magic beans, and they drive away. And his brother said, what was that all about? It's like, oh, if I take these magic beans, I'll fly. And they just laugh at him and walk away. Well, that night, Andrew opens the packet up, pours it in, makes a stew for himself, and then eats the stew as fast as he can. And he goes to bed, and he's like, I can't fly. this." And he's really sad, but his stomach hurts, and it hurts. Next morning, he wakes up, and his stomach's just so hurting and so painful. He walks up to his brothers and says, guys, I don't think I should have eaten those beans. Those really hurt. And I, I, they said I could fly, but I can't. I don't know what to do. And suddenly, he goes, and whew, he flies off into the sky as far as he can go and his brothers are staring at him as he forwards again off he goes in a different direction and all over the place and the moral of the story was be careful what you wish for you never know how it's going to be answered right and, and right there my, uh, all the moms in the world are like oh no a fart joke right okay so my boys love that story but the question really is how do you evaluate a story like that right moms you're over there rolling your eyes little boys think it's hilarious my daughter at this age might be like oh goodness dads are kind of like hey, 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 hey i wish i had told that story you know there's a different way for every man woman and child to evaluate a story and to look at it and the same thing goes for our family stories same thing goes for your life story. We evaluate our stories differently. Maybe, ladies, uh, moms, um, men, you evaluate it according to somebody else. You're sitting around, you're listening to the stories of their last vacation, of how they went fishing and camping and all of a sudden you wish, oh man, I wish that was my family. Maybe you're looking on Instagram and seeing the beautiful parties and the awesome things that these families get to do and you're thinking, oh man, I wish that was my family. Maybe, you know what? You've just had it rough. You've just gone through a divorce. Your kids are with you, but you're thinking through your story and you're like, your story's over. It's ruined. This, the family things, my kids are done. The way, the way he was treating them or, you know, whatever. Maybe you just look at a situation and it's just never been good. You've never had a chance to really 
think about your story or evaluate your story, and you really wouldn't want to if you could. Well, this series is about one thing, asking this one question, what measure, what way should we evaluate our life stories? In what way should we evaluate our family stories? What way should you look at your children, your in-laws, the whole situation that God has placed you in in a family and examine that? And what I want to challenge you is that we want to not look at the moments. We want to look at the movements of life. And what I mean by that is like movements in a story. In fact, when God evaluates our lives, He doesn't do it immediately. He waits until the end. And I want to show you this. In fact, it's in the book of Revelation. We see that at the end of the whole story of the Bible, we have Jesus saying, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense. So he's going to bring his judgment to repay everyone for what he has done. And then he says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is the whole story. He sees it all. That's his point. There's no part of this that isn't a part of his purview. And so now he comes to bring a recompense. Now he comes to bring the judgment. God waits to the end of the story. God waits to bring the whole story to a close before he judges the story itself, namely your life. And yet what you and I can get caught into is that we can eventually evaluate, evaluate lives by the moments. Imagine if God did that. If he just evaluated all of us at that moment, he stopped the creation. He's just like, this is awesome. Perfect. We're done. You know, I'm not going to, there's no growth. There's no nothing. They're, they're perfect. And we sin. He just keeps looking at creation. No, he would need to judge the whole story. And some of us, we get caught and we look at our, our families and we, we don't want to look at the fall. We want to kind of shade our eyes and only look at the creation. We're like, look how great we are. And God even made our flaws and those flaws are great and they're beautiful and good. No, that's not a whole story interpretation. Many of us just get caught in the fall. And imagine if God just got caught in the fall. He'd be condemning, condemning, condemning. There's no redemption, no salvation, nothing like that. He's just out to destroy, destroy, destroy. No, God waits for the whole movement, all four movements of his story to happen. That's why I want to challenge us in this series to become a four-movement family, to stop thinking of yourself in one moment or only one movement, but all four movements of this great story. How do we go through this beginning all the way to the end and evaluate our lives? See, in God's story, there are four movements. We have the creation. We say he's created, and then things get ruined in the fall. And when we see that ruin, if things are messed up and broken, and yet God doesn't leave it there. He redeems it. He buys it back through Jesus Christ. He buys it back through his work in Israel to Jesus and in the end. And then finally, he's going to make it something new. It's becoming something greater. He's going to restructure, rebuild it, put it back together in perfection. And these are these four movements that we should evaluate ourselves by. And so what I want to challenge you in this series is to evaluate the moments of your life, evaluate the moments that you're in by focusing on the movements of God's story, the four movements that we have. This creation, this ruin, this redemption, and this becoming, these four things flowing together. And in this series, we're gonna take one week on each one of these movements in order to kind of put it together, see how we can begin to evaluate our lives, our families, and the, and the situation around us so that we can find that ultimate purpose that God has for our families, that God may have for you, that God has in these relationships that we call family. And I want to challenge you not to just set this aside, but be here for these next four weeks, every single one. Hey, I want to invite you, come back to service, sit outside and join us so you're here to engage in these messages right there, right then, and be part of this four movement family start for you. And this is where we're going to start. We're going to start at the first movement, and that first movement is the movement of creation. And it's in the movement of creation that we find God's intention. We find out what God's intent was at this beginning and the start. And so if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you to open it up to page one. That's right, right there at the beginning, possibly page two uh, in some of your Bibles. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter one, and I want to show you kind of what this intention was. Now, my purpose in this is simple. Some of you have never had the chance to look at what God's intention for your children, for your life, for your spouse, for your parents, for your in-laws. You've never had that opportunity. Life's been way too hard, way too hectic, way too crazy. Maybe you got married because you were having a kid. Maybe you've been a single mom, or maybe you're in a situation where that marriage has fallen apart. And right now, it's hard to remember that idyllic, 
awesome moment when you first got married and things were good and you had all the dreams and hopes. When that child came, you had all this vision when you were going to educate them and see what God was going to do. And life's just kind of taken its uh, bat out and whacked it on you enough times that, man, it's rough. I want to take today on this Mother's Day and give you a chance to back up and examine God's intention again by looking at God's original intention in the garden. Now, some people are like, oh, this is all mythology. Why would we even look at this? I just kind of stand this way. When you look at Jesus, Jesus indicated that Adam and Eve and the creation were real events. And that if Jesus, who rose from the dead and was God, looks at this this way, that, hey, I go with Jesus. You, you can look at how you want, but what you're going to see is some powerful indicators of what human life is really about. And I think it's going to help us see a lot about how we view our life. And this is written by ancient Israelites in a long time ago, and it's a great challenge. And so I want you to go there with me. Genesis chapter 1, we're starting at verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over all every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, he goes on, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you got a pen and you're ready, underline that image of God section. God made him in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. This is going to be a critical piece. As we move forward, he goes on to say that, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And here's the thing. This gives you this original intention that God has for our lives as the image of God. We're going to get back to this, so keep your Bible open to there. We don't want to leave, but we want to start with this reality. Starting with the image of God, God intended you to represent Him. We're going to say this later in the year, but it's not about self-expression for life. It's about God's expression through you in life, okay? God made you to image Him. He's the original. You're the derivative. He's the beginning. You represent Him. And this is critical to understanding that you're not going to discover your intention in your life, your purpose for your family, or you find out how, why God's put you there by looking inside. You need to look out. You need to get to know God. You see, God made you to represent Him. Aquinas was a, uh, an ancient, he'd be ancient to us, but he was a Middle Ages professor, basically uh, the doctor of the Catholic Church. And in his... Uh, uh, in his theology, one of the most poignant statements that I can remember being taught to me in seminary was this. He said, it takes an infinite amount of man to reflect back the infinite glory of God. In other words, it would take an infinite amount of human beings to truly reflect back everything about God. And, and you just can't. In other words, we're a fleck. We're a piece of God's attributes. You're a little simple reflection, a little spark of his divine nature and beauty in this world. Now, we're limited. We're not God. We are not being like Him, but we are imaged like Him. And our job, again, is to show Him off. And every person in your family has this intention. Your children, your husband, your wife, your in-laws, your grandparents, your parents, everyone has this same intention. It's why God made us. And it's why sin is so horrible, if you think about it. And we can get into this more next week, but People have always wondered in youth groups, like when I have talked to kids, they're like, well, why does God care if I lie? I mean, he doesn't, he's not there. I'm not lying to him. And yet we see is indeed every sin is against God because every human you've ever met represents God. So whenever we treat a human a certain way, we treat God that way. And whenever they treat you that way, they're treating God that way. And in fact, in a real way, we're taking God's ID. We're like taking his actual like passport and his information and who he is, and we're completely misrepresenting him as a liar. When God's not a liar, I don't know about you, I don't like having my ID stolen. I don't like being misrepresented. I don't want to be slandered. And every time we lie, we represent God slanderously. We represent God in a wrong way. So God's very much connected to every single thing that we do in our sins. He sees us as representing him. This is how serious it is gets, whether it's with your children, whether it's with you, whether it's your parents, you name it, we are there to represent Him, to represent God. Now, this means that God has a shape 
in that image for every single one of you. As he goes on, he says, look, you, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So there's this reflection that we have, and that means there's a shape that comes out of this. And I want you to understand this shape. Jesus was the perfect example of God, and he had every attribute of God because he was God shining through humanity. That to me says one thing, that you and I are to represent God because we have all of his attributes in a very finite, limited form. You say, what does that mean? Well, just take a look. Start here. It says, no one's ever seen God. At the end of John, he's speaking, saying, the only son who is the bosom of the Father, meaning in intimacy with God, he has made him known. Jesus came to earth and showed what God was like perfectly. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Well, how can he do that? Because he was human. He imaged God perfectly. In fact, Paul goes on to say that he is the image of God. In their case, God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, right? So Jesus is what we want to be. He, Jesus is the original intention that we get to become again, and we'll get to that in the end. But right now, remember, all of us were intended to be like this. We were intended to have his attributes shining through us. You say, what in the world does this have to do with anything, Greg? How many of you have taken a personality test recently? You know, there's that big thing called the Enneagram out there everybody's into. Maybe you've taken the Myers-Briggs test with the uh, INFP, ENTJ, all that stuff. Maybe instead you've taken a, a DISC test or the OCEAN test or something like this where they're attempting to help you um, see that your personality is of a group. But I think all these attempts at understanding human personality is, is really trying to grasp how we all individually and uniquely show off God's attributes. God's creative. And you know some of your children are way more creative than other children. God is omniscient. He's all intelligent. And we know there are some of us that have a little bit more intelligence than others, but he's also wise. And just because somebody's intelligent doesn't mean they're always wise. Some of you are more wise than others. Hey, God's omnipresent, right? I mean, he's everywhere. Well, we're present. And some of us a little bit more than others, speaking for myself. I'm not always that present in particular conversations. But you get what I'm saying. If we were to examine and look at the attributes of God, what you would begin to see is how you reflect who he is in various ways. Some with strengths and some not so much because God's made you uniquely to image him in a particular way. We're not all one person. We're diverse because we get this chance in all these cultures and these languages and these personalities to show off the great and glorious beauty of God. Now that's incredible because that means your family has a specific shape. And the more you would understand God and his attributes, the more you will begin to grasp who your family, how your family represents God, how you look. And I, I just can't wait to help you guys see this. And so maybe you take a personality test, maybe you take a strengths finder or something like that. That's awesome. But I would recommend you grabbing a simple book by A.W. Pink called The Attributes of God. Take a minute, sit down with those, that book, and just scroll through. It's very short. You can get it on Kindle, I think, actually for free. And you can look at the attributes of God that have been laid out there. When you examine those, you can begin to go like, hey, I'm a little bit more like this. Uh, I'm a little less like this. You can begin to see some of your different quirks and different things come out in your children amongst all of us because God's original intention is for us to represent him. When you see that, now you can step back and look at the shape. How has God made our family? Wow, we're way more brainiac in my family, to be quite honest, than some other families. Like we sit around, we talk about philosophy and politics, and we sit around and we talk about God, and we talk about all these things at the dinner table with my teenagers. And they like it. Now, one of our kids is not necessarily like that. He wants to get out there and go run and jump and do stuff, which helps us because, man, when we go hiking, he's there. He's making it fun. We're engaging. But that's the shape of our family. And we see the strengths and we see these differences. And we're able to relate with each other. And then when I look at my in-laws or I look at my family, my parents or my siblings, it gives me a chance to understand, hey, this is kind of who God made us and how God put us together and the shape that we have as a family. Maybe that has something then to do with what God in intends for you to do on earth. You see, God made you and your family and your children a certain way for the sake of moving you forward. And that means he wants you to engage. Now, here's the danger when we talk about personality. It can get to the place where you feel 
like, hey, I'm lesser because I don't have those attributes over those. And this is a classic problem. I want you to imagine with me that on the stage there would be three boxes that are laid out. And in one box, we have creativity. In another box, we have this ability for just physical strength. In another box, we have this depth of emotion. So we got three different boxes. And you evaluate your family and find out, oh, your, your son is very emotional, but he's not very athletic. He's not really in the physical strength category. Your, your daughter is very intellectual, but, you know, whatever. And you are the box over there in the uh, athletic physical strength category kind of thing. And, and next thing you know, what happens in a lot of families is instead of looking at each other as unique in the boxes as God intends us to be to show him off, we take those boxes. And one by one, we stack them on top of each other, and we put one at the top and one at the bottom. And we say that, oh, emotional ability, that's the bottom. Intelligence, that's pretty good. But man, if you don't have athletic prowess, if you're not strong, then you are worthless. And suddenly, we realize that if you try to climb a ladder of boxes, you're going to fall over. Boxes make lousy ladders. And yet what we do as a society is we put everybody in a pecking order of boxes. And what we want to tell you is how God made you isn't good enough. Can I tell you something? You're made in the image of God. Christ himself is what we're intended to be like. Christ himself is the most valuable one ever. In fact, when we think about Christ and his value, we're told his value. He's, we're told this, knowing you are ransomed from the feudal ways inherited by your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. I like silver and gold. Anybody else here? It'd be great to have some silver and gold right now. But it's nothing compared to the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without spot or blem a blemish or spot. And what he gave us is himself, the most valuable thing, person in the world is Jesus, the image of God. You and I are the image of God. That means our lives in its intention are infinitely, incalculably valuable. You can't put a value on someone because of their ability at work or their intelligence or their, or their ability with emotional reason. No, it doesn't matter if you have a child with Down syndrome. It doesn't matter if you have a child with autism. It doesn't matter if you have a highly intellectual successful child. You know, it's those things are all un, uh, not about value at all. They don't have anything to do with the value of the child, the value of you as a parent, the value of your parents. No, the value that comes through is infinite no matter what. And that's why, to be quite honest as an application, why God intended marriage to, and, and sex to only be in marriage and to bring about children, the image of God, right? Because when you get married, you're saying, I value you rightly. My life for yours, your life for mine. Boom, now there's a lock. Anything else devalues. Anything else says, I'm not willing to pay you to give you what you value, so give me all of you, and I'll give you the promise that I love you. Give me all of you, and I'll take you on a few dates, or I've taken you on a few dates, so now give me all of you. No, the only true value of a human-to-human -human relationship like marriage is all my life for all your life, now sex is available, and what comes out but another image of God. That's the beauty of marriage. That's the beauty of that valuing. That's how deeply wedded it is into our world. And why we feel so devalued in our world is we shredded all of this. Now your value is in, you know, what you can do and how you can do it and what you claim you are and how many people clap for you and how many likes you have. That's a very fragile environment. But you are made in the image of God. Your children are the image of God. They can withstand a lot when they know that their value is in heaven, infinite and, res and reserved there, can never be taken away. And you need that value because otherwise this world will steal it. It will crush you and your vision and dr dreams that God has intended for you will not happen. And the next movement will crush your life unless you remember we're made in the image of God to represent him. And that is in a unique way. And it's from that character of being in God's image that you can move to the most important things. Yeah, we don't value all these things differently. Yeah, somebody's more athletic. Yes, yeah, somebody's more uh, intellectual. Yes, yeah, somebody's more emotional, whatever. Somebody's more present than others. What I challenge you is to think about character then. If your value is set, now it's about character. Now it's about living out in the way that God would, with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. None of those things are going to bring about value. There's no law against them, and they're not going to challenge you. And so God has given you a value. He's given you a shape. And know it. Learn it. Figure that out with your family. And it'll take you a step forward 
in this first movement. The second thing that we see in this passage, back to Genesis chapter 1, is that we see that God has a place for each family and each family member. He, he goes right into it. He said, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Now, we know that he's put them in the garden to do this. That's their place, and their place is to expand and to grow it. There's a mission about the place that they've been set, because each family is given a place to impact. This is technically called in theology the cultural mandate. Every family, every human is given this mandate to be fruitful and multiply. That means to expand God's kingdom. That may be adopting children into your family. That may be meaning that bringing a single man or woman into your family so that they have a, a family unit that they're influencing children and others in. That may be not resisting your parents and moving away, but keeping connected to those who multiplied and brought you in, right? So we multiply and fill this earth. And we subdue it. Now, that doesn't mean we crush it. That literally meant that we bring it under God's order. We were given the chance to bring God's order and reality to this world. We have dominion. That means we are going to rule it with kindness. That means we've been given the right to rule it. That's why we're the ones who stand there and tell the whale, jump. And the whale jumps. Last time I checked, a pigeon isn't out there going, and up jumps a whale. That doesn't happen. No other animal on the planet has tamed the world like we do with the science and with the knowledge and the care. And when we do it rightly and we do it under God's love, the world thrives. It doesn't die. It really does thrive. And that's the call to Christians, the call to your family, that we'd be part of the place that we're in to make it thrive. So this is the question for you. How do you bring your family shape into the place that you're at? You realize that God placed you in a place. He has set you on your block. He has set you in that school, on that soccer team, or on that basketball team. He has set you in that youth group at this church. He's put you in a place. Why? So that you would multiply and bring it under God, so it would thrive under God's shape and guidance. And He's made you a certain way so that that would happen. If you're intellectual, he's made you there to help thrive in the intellectual space. If he's made you emotional, to help thrive in the emotional space. If he's made you present, to help thrive about, around those people you're with. If you're extroverted, to thrive with those around you. Introverted, to thrive with a few people. It doesn't matter. But the point is that wherever you're at, you represent God in the way that he has made you to see God's beauty thrive there. That means that you and I, we get to go to work and bring about good things and harmony in our workplaces and kindness and gentleness. We see it thrive. And that's the goal because we want to see something thrive. Where are you at? What is God calling you to make thrive? Where, how in your neighborhood? How in your workplace? How with your children, your school, these kinds of things? This is so critical as you learn your shape to ask that question, where has he placed us? What place are we in? And when you do this, you're going to end up seeing that your children are going to take that step, right? We, we have this idea, train up the child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Well, your children have this bent, and if you see the place that God has for them, and you see the bend that he's put in them, and you're able to bring that about and care for them, they're going to thrive in their places. Your nieces, your nephews, the, your, your brothers, your sisters, when you see this, we're able to have a vision for each other and say, hey, I think your place in this world really works well here, and God's going to use you to thrive. And so maybe it's the arts, maybe it's science, maybe it's politics, whatever it is, this is an awesome opportunity. Just for a hint, on days like birthdays and Christmas, you can do this to help bring place and thrive by, um, by a simple way of giving gifts. Uh, I know families that give a gift, a spiritual gift, a gift according to what their shape is like, and a gift for their future. That really helps them begin to have a vision for where they're going, has an opportunity to grow in that skill, and have a depth with God. That's a beautiful concept. And just simple things like that can help begin to drive and cause our children to thrive, cause us to thrive, our spouse, even our family members, to thrive in the place that God has put us. But that's not all. Not only do you have a shape and a value, not only do you have a place, God has a time for each family and each family member. And this time is important because you are not able to identify yourself by anything other than your time, your place, and your shape, right? I'm not Marie Antoinette. I don't live in Marie Antoinette's time. I am not a female. I am not genetically that way. I am not emotionally that way. I don't live in a time period. I don't live in the place of, of Vienna. I don't have anything to be able to be that person. 
I don't have anything to be Abraham Lincoln. I'm in the wrong time. And so here's the thing. You live now. And God intended you to live now. As Paul said in the book of Acts, he says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods. There you go. There's your time. The allotted period, you live now. And now is the time that you have with your family. What stage are your children in? What stage are your brothers and sisters in? What stage is your family in? Now is the time that you can say, hey, God, what time is it now? If you're a student listening to this, are you in junior high? Are you in high school? Don't waste this time. God gave it to you now to do something great with it, to use your shape, to use this place that you're in, and the time that you have to make a difference. Why were you born in COVID? Why were you alive at this time period? What is God calling us to be in salt and light in this world? Because God has a time for us, and we need to understand the time. I love this. In the Old Testament, these men of Issachar, as they're looking at this, these warriors being put together to fight, they go, uh, the men of Issachar, who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. They had 200 chiefs, and their kinsmen were under the control. And what's beautiful about this is that these men knew the time. They knew what they ought to do. Guys, when we see our shape, when we know the place, and we observe the time that we're in, we see the trends that are coming at us and where they come from. Where we understand the, whether it, it's coming from Christian nationalism, whether it's coming from CRT, whether it's coming from just the confusion that we're having about uh, political positions and Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter. Do you know what time you're in and how it's affecting you? Do you know what time you live in so that you can be effective in our world? Do you know your place and then do you know your time? Because when you grasp these with your shape, you'll begin to see how God wants to call you to show him off and make his kingdom thrive. And so as we focus in on these movements, what you're going to discover is that this begins to shape what God's intention is for your family. In the movement of creation, we're going to see, hey, this is maybe the intention God has for us. In fact, the simple way we've put it in our family is we want our children to love God, to love each other, and to love others, and to know what God has called them to do and to do it. And that's a simple way of putting what we're talking about, to know what God has called you to do and to do it. And God has called you as a person, who you are, valued as he's made you. God has put you in this place, in the places that you're at, on purpose, in the time that you're in, in the shape that you are, because he has something for you, your family, and those around you to do, to represent him well. Not to show yourself off, to show God off. Not to be self-expressive, but to be God-expressive. And what kind of thriving could occur in our world if that's what we were doing on our block, in our work, at the field, on the freeway, wherever we find ourselves, in the church. And I want to encourage you to take some time to sit down and think through, like, what is our shape? What's our personalities like? What is it really like? And let, examine those and ignore the brokenness, ignore the fall. We'll get to the mess next week. And the mess is really big and I hope it'll help you, but it's there. No, look at the intention, dream again. Stop, lift up out of the scenario, the situation that you're struggling through and just go, God, who did you make me to be? Where did you put me? Why am I here now? Would you begin to show me? I'm ready to take the first step of the movement and see what you're doing. And if you do that, I believe God will indeed bless you greatly. And here's the thing. All of us may have these dreams and all of us may have these wonderful thoughts, but this is the first movement. And today, you may be sitting there with your parent, your mom, your dad, and watching this. Maybe it's some other time that your mom's just like, we're watching church, you know, because it's, it's time to. I want to challenge you. God loves you. He challenges you by making you in his image. But as I said, we sin. We misrepresent God. And I don't know about you. I'd be ticked if someone misrepresented me. And God is ticked. In fact, he says, at that end, I'm coming with recompense. I'm going to bring a judgment. But we don't have to face that judgment. The beautiful thing is that hell does not have to be found for anyone. It doesn't have to come for you. But we have sinned and we have to pay God back somehow. We have to make it right. There's got to be justice for God. And God, God, what God did is he said, I will find my justice. And at the cross of Jesus Christ, what he did is he took the justice on himself. God said, I'll bear your punishment. I'll bear your hell. I'll bear your mess. I'll take your guilt, your shame, and all the junk that you did to me, and I'll put it on myself because I want to set you free. I want you to know me. I don't want that sin to be in the way, and I love you too much to let that be between us. And it cost him a lot. It cost him his life and suffering, massive suffering, so that you could know him. And here's the thing, it, it, he opens the door to a relationship with him through you simply trusting his work on the cross. And I want to give you that chance to do that right now. I want to give you that chance to make that decision today. 
that, hey, I need to be right with God. I need, to, I need God's justice not to fall on me because I want to know him. I want to know what my intention is. I want to know how he's going to use me in this world because I want to, I want to have a purpose. And I know it's not inside. So if that's you today and you need to begin that relationship with God, begin it, then you need to receive what Jesus did on the cross. And so here's a way to do that. Right where you're at, you can simply just say, God in heaven, I know that I've sinned. And I trust that Jesus took my sin from me and all the consequences of hell on the cross. I trust that you've forgiven me. I trust that you want to use me. And so would you come in my life, show me my purpose, and point me forward. I'm ready to follow you. And if you said that to him, connect with him, let us know. You can, you can let us know by simply uh, following this tag at the bottom here and, and where to text and, and the information. Or you can click right now in the screen and say, hey, um, guys, if you're watching this live, I've made this decision, put your hand up. They'll, they'll be prompting you, take a look at that. This is a beginning point. We're gonna get you information. We wanna help you work through your doubts. We're gonna get you moving. This is a beginning place, not the ending place. And there's a lot to go through and we wanna encourage you to move forward. Welcome to the family. We're excited. Let someone right there in your family know and let's move forward together. Otherwise, may God bless you guys as you dream again about that creation, about how God has made you. And moms, happy Mother's Day. I pray that God has redeemed something in your soul today about the purpose, the shape, the time, and the place for your family. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happiest Mother Day is Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom and Grandma. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. 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 Happy M